didn't realize it was a complex subject because I've been doing it so long. But he basically asked me, how do I make a living as a, as a doctor? After I graduate from medical school, graduate from residency, and I'm an attending, or I am a uh, surgeon that's actually making money, or a family doctor, or physical medicine and rehabilitation medicine, which is what he wants to go into. Um, we kind of went into it, and I realized that I was about an hour in to the conversation before I actually started making sense to him and he asked me because he's been watching the YouTube lectures he kind of asked about you know can you explain it to me so that other medical students can see and I said well I'll video it and I'm driving back home so I have time to explain it uh, so when you graduate and you are a official MD so you finish a fellowship you finish a residency you have then got to decide what you want to do and where you want to do it. You got to decide where you're going to live and that includes your spouse, whether your husband or your wife, they have a job where they can actually make money in an area. Um, you got to decide if you want to go home, live close to your parents, not close to your parents, because you've also got to decide about childcare at some point. Um, my ex-wife and I, we ended up moving to a place where we had no family. So that was a little more complicated because it was just us. As far as, so that's one thing that I would kind of hesitate against, but we made it work. Cost more money because we had to get a nanny to cover the times that we weren't available because we're both physicians. As far as once you figure out where you want to go, family, all that good stuff, buy a house, rent a house, from a surgeon standpoint and from a primary care doctor standpoint, there are a lot of banks like SunTrust, has one. I think Wells Fargo used to have one. <coughs> they have loans to buy houses that are specifically geared towards physicians. The main reason they're geared towards physicians is because we have high income but low money. So we can't put a big down payment on a house but we'll start generating revenue immediately. So there's that advantage. Okay, whether you buy a big house, small house, that's up to you. Um, now, the two things that you gotta decide is whether you're gonna work in private practice or an academic setting. A private practice means you have no association or a very loose association with an academic center. So you don't work for Emory University, you don't work for the University of Alabama, i.e. their paycheck, your paycheck, does not have their signature or their stamp on it versus academics and that's where you get a paycheck from the school now from an academic standpoint and I'm speaking really from a general surgery standpoint but there are a lot of different models but they all kind of have the same you are responsible for teaching residents and with that there are certain benefits those benefits include stuff like call coverage so you don't have to answer phone calls in the middle of the night because your residents typically are doing that. So you have access to a lot of state-of-the-art technology, um, state-of-art medical care that a lot of places don't have. You have a large referral base. Now, you make call, you make money taking call, so you're probably going to get paid less. Um, you get paid by the graduate medical education camera ACG and me I think so they put some money in Medicare put some money in um, so a lot of entities put in money your bonuses typically in academics are either done by a relative value unit RVU when private practice it is as well but it's not a direct payment so if you do say the relative value is worth $37 and you do two RVUs, you get paid $74. In academics, you'll get a smaller percentage of that because there are a lot of benefits that come. You get to do papers, you get more time off, you have residents that are working for you in your lab, 
you have dedicated lab time, so you're not always seeing patients. So for when I started out, academic surgeons were making about $150,000 a year versus private practice general surgeons were making about $225,000 a year starting out. So there's a difference, and that's because you're not seeing patients. You're teaching, so you're educating and seeing patients. Versus private practice, you are seeing patients. You get paid directly by seeing patients. Every once in a while, some will have a practice buy-in because there's some um, rent that if they own a building, if they're part owner in a surgery center, if they uh, have a MRI machine and they're charging for the MRI machine, MRI machine and they get revenue from that, you have to buy into that. But starting out, you will make a little more in private practice. But again, you're trading some of those benefits. So you don't have residents that can take that 2 a.m. phone call for Tylenol in the middle of the night. Um, it's, you see patients every 15 minutes as opposed to in attending, you might see patients every 30 minutes because your resident, your medical sees, student sees them for five minutes, your resident sees them for 10, 15 minutes, the PA sees them for five minutes, and then you come in and make sure everything was done correctly. Now, so you're seeing a lot more patients, so you're doing a lot more volume, so you t traditionally make more money, but you're also working a lot harder. A lot of academic programs have tried to do a hybrid of that. So let's say in academics, you see 100 patients a month to generate $150,000 worth of salary. In private practice, you'll see 250 patients a month to generate $275,000 worth of salary. So you're working harder, seeing more patients, but you're making more money. Now in private practice, there are two options, solo practice or a group practice. Now a group practice can either be a group owned by the hospital or a group owned by physicians. And there's not much difference between being a solo practice or a small group that's not owned by a hospital. The biggest difference in private practice is whether you're owned by the Piedmont Clinic, the RMC Clinic, Northside Clinic, Wellstar Clinic. Um, if you're owned by that, you have some of the benefits of being owned by a hospital practice. One is you get paid a little extra bump for Medicare and Medicaid, so you make more doing less. And you also have deep pockets versus if you're in private practice or you're in solo practice like me, if I do $40,000 worth of surgery and my bills are $45,000, I lose $5,000 that month and I don't get paid. Um, or conversely, if I make, if I do $50,000 worth of surgery and my bills that month are only 35, I get paid $15,000, I get to take it out. Versus if you're in a hospital practice, they typically will set your salary and you will make that based on whether you do $30,000 or $40,000 or $50,000 that month. What they will then do is at the end of the year, they'll come back and say, we paid you $300,000 this year but after we calculated it out, you only made $270,000 of that 300. So you owe us 30. So we're going to lower your salary by $30,000 from last year. And we think you're slowing down. You're not seeing more patients. So we're probably, just to cover our end, lower you another $20,000 so that we don't have as big of a loss. So we're going to pay you two fifty dollars next year, and then we'll see how it does. If you're over, a lot of times they have uh, bonuses based on RVUs. So once you cover your base, so you make that 
let's say we'll call it for simple math, three hundred sixty thousand dollars a year. So if you make that thirty thousand above expenses, because it's not thirty thousand dollars just to cover your salary, it's thirty thousand dollars over the expenses, which you don't control as a physician, which is where it gets tricky. Um, so if you make that thirty thousand dollars, it's cool. If you make twenty five, you lose five. If you make over that, they'll say, we'll split the difference. So if we made $40,000 more than, so $10,000 more than the 30, you keep half, I keep half. So that's 50% over your required RVUs comes to you as a bonus. So instead of making 30,000 that month, you make 35 that month, but don't think and, and the, but they keep that extra because there's more cost the more work that you do the, re, the way that they do it. And we'll talk about RBUs at some point, not now, because um, I'm almost at my office. Now in private practice solo, or you're just basically by yourself or in a small group that's not sponsored by a hospital or just by yourself, it changes a little different. So, like I said, one week I might make 30, one, one week I might make 40. Those weeks that I make 30 a month, I mean, that month I make 30 a month, that's just my salary. If I make less than that, there's no money to pay unless I've stored it. So I either don't pay myself or pay myself less. But some of those, but if I make more, I get more. Usually in private practice, that more you store. You don't just go out and spend it, you save it. Now your expenses are really where it gets tricky. In solo practice, I have three and a half employees. That's all I need. In a, in a hospital-based practice or group practice, they may say you're responsible for five employees. So even though I'm using three and a half, I'm responsible for five because of the way that they calculate it. That's an extra $50,000 a year that I'm responsible for that I'm not using. Also, what is written off as a business expense is determined by your practice versus yourself. So if I buy, for me, I buy video equipment. I buy video equipment all the time for uh, channels and stuff. If I buy a new camera, for me, that's a business expense in solo practice. In a group practice, they may say, since your Instagram account or your YouTube account is just for you, we bought it for the practice, but we'll only give you credit for $3,000 of camera purchases a year, or we'll, you can only say 2,500 of it is a write-off expense. The rest of it, you have to reimburse us, or it's not covered at all, you don't have that option. Um, the reason that plays into your salary is because if I buy a $3,000 camera with um, office money, all of that $3,000 is pre-tax and that item is depreciated over time against the entire amount of money that I bring in versus if I'm an employee and they don't allow me to write off expenses like that, that $3,000 has to come out post-tax. So I actually have to make about... 4500 to get $3,000 to buy that, and unless I set up my own LLC, I can't really write it off. So you'll see some practices that have a large amount of write-offs for small things that would normally be taxable. So you'll see some people say, I only make $120,000 a year, but they have $120,000 of deductible stuff like their large car, uh, truck that they drive, computers, all that stuff. So that's technically revenue or income, but it's not taxable the same way. So, but that 120 that you get in salary plus the 120 you write off, that's the same thing as making, so that's 240, but remember that 120 would normally be taxable. So that 240, really is the equivalent of 360. So if you're making 360 in private practice, 
I mean, 360 in an academic facility or a hospital-based practice versus 240 as a solo practitioner and you control all the cost, you're technically making the exact same. That's why people do private practice or small groups so they can control those expenses a little better. But again, remember, you don't get that hospital bump, which can be up to almost a quarter of your salary, and uh, not a quarter of your salary, a quarter of the money that you bill as uh, income. And remember, there's a difference between billing versus collecting. Um, the easiest way to explain that is, if I do a gallbladder and charge the insurance company $1,000. If the insurance company is only paying me $500, then that's all I get paid. I can't hold the patient responsible for the other five because I have a contractual obligation. So when you hear people say, um, I had to write off $100,000 this year, that write-off is based on what the insurance companies are willing to pay. Deductibles don't come out of that amount that they write off. It comes out of the amount that the insurance company says they're going to pay. So if I do a gallbladder, bill an insurance company, I can bill them $20,000. They're still only going to contractually pay me $500. If the patient has a $200 deductible, then the patient pays me $200 and the insurance only pays me $300. We'll get into that later, but that's pretty much a quick overview, although it's not quick, about how the game is played, how you make money afterwards, and hopefully that gives you a little information as to decide whether you want to do academics or private practice, group or solo. All right, guys, take Oh, call. Remember, lifestyle is the biggest issue, so you always look at what your call coverage is and how many days off you get per month whether they're paid, not paid, all that stuff too. It's not just about the money, it's about the time and lifestyle. All right guys, thanks, take care.